Welcome to the Creating Well Simplified Podcast. My name is Lauren Wells, here with my co-host, Chris Seveny. We're committed to providing you with the knowledge required to build wealth through real estate investing. Tired of consuming content about real estate? Stuck in analysis paralysis? Ready to do your first deal? As a member of our community, you will learn how to go from consuming content to taking that first step into the world of real estate investing. Our show is not about getting rich quick, but about providing you with the knowledge you need to take action. Join us as we speak with experienced investors who share action tips on how to escape the corporate world, start a thriving side hustle in the world of real estate, and go beyond your W-2 or 401k. My name is Lauren Wells, and I am here with my co-host, Chris Seveny. Welcome to the Creating Wealth Simplified podcast, where each week we bring you education and information that will help you take your next step in building wealth through real estate. On today's episode, we want to talk about the top five strategies you should implement when researching a sponsor or thinking about whether or not you're going to invest with a specific sponsor. So to kick that off, Chris, what would you say is the, or what, why is this important? Let's start there. Oh, it's, well, it's extreme. I mean, this is one of the most important aspects of investing that I think people kind of just brush aside a little bit. And somebody mentioned to me once, the example provided was, say you have a rental property and you're putting a tenant in there. And let's say your rental property is $1,000 per month. You do credit checks, background checks. I mean, you basically do like, you know, full cavity search on this person for $1,000 a month. But then you'll turn around and want to invest $100,000 or $50,000 in some type of syndication. And you're going off of a, you know, a nice Facebook ad or somebody who heard from that of that company, but never invested in them and is going off of third party information. So it's extremely important uh, whenever you're giving anybody uh, significant or even $500 yep. to really understand who that person is, that sponsor is, who the company is. And, you know, we're going to talk about the, the strategies or things that you should pay attention to. Yeah, I would call it a controllable risk. Like, so, you know, every investment has risks, no matter what kind of stock market, real estate, there's risks. And a lot of them are outside of your control for the most part, whether mm -hmm. that is because the economy is influ influencing it or whatever. But with this, this you get to choose who the person that you invest with is. And mm -hmm. so I feel like it's one of the things that you can control as far as doing your due diligence and really knowing who that person is and what they're about. So you're already putting, I think of it as you're already risking not risking. You're already investing in something that has some sense, sort of risk to it. Why would you not mm -hmm. do the due diligence on the person when you know that that is something you can kind of control, whether they're, you know, what type of person you're investing with? Yeah, absolutely. It's like you mentioned, it's just such an important factor to consider. And like I mentioned, I think a lot of times people gloss over it a little bit, which, yeah. uh, you know, first rule I always tell people of investing is, you know, do your due diligence on every single person. Yeah. I think that throughout the podcast, since I've joined, we've probably talked about this quite a bit, just every single episode, it just comes up because it is so important. Um, mm -hmm. So let's start with number one, know who you are dealing with. Well, why, thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so first and foremost, you know, I say before you get on a call with somebody, or, you know, first you do want to set up a call and get them on the phone to make sure, A, they have like a legitimate phone number and an email address. And it's not a, you know, John sells homes at gmail.com email address. Uh, do Can some I research. Pause you there for a second. I actually yeah. had someone who listens to the podcast email me jokingly, like, I think I should get a new email. <laughs> uh, they're <laughs> they're going to invest in our new fund. And he jokingly was like, oh, you know, I listened to the podcast. I think it's time for me to get a new email. And his wasn't even that bad, but that's just funny that you bring yeah. that up. Well, it's also like, if you're looking to raise, you know, millions of dollars, if you can't spend $10 a month on a domain email address, to me, that just seems odd. Yeah. Uh, you know, as part of part of the business process. So 
before you, you know, first you want to, of course, get them on the phone, Zoom or meet in person, but do your due diligence on that person. You know, Google them, look them up on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, a lot of us people in space can run skip tracing for like 50 cents a name where you can basically on a public search, check if they have a criminal rec record, check if they have judgments against them, you know, kind of really do a thorough evaluation of who that person is, what's your background, but it also be important when you get on the phone with them, because if you see on LinkedIn or on Facebook or something that, oh, they might have, be from an area you're familiar with, or might have an interest. Um, also, you could ask them about that because you also want to know, A, what is it, how they run their business, but a little bit of backstory about why they do what they do as well. Yeah. And I think today, especially like looking at their LinkedIn and their social media, you'll get a good sense of like who someone is. And you can kind of, if you've been on social media, you can kind of start to sift through the people that are like all all talk, all flash versus the people who actually know what they're talking about. Um, so, I mean, I definitely think having a LinkedIn profile for me is when it comes to real estate is something that I would be like, if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, like, I don't know to me that you don't stand out as credible. So one thing I'll mention too is, I mean, you hear on the news all the time about, you know, I think there was one recently in Ohio where like the football coach was arrested or indicted on a $53 million Ponzi scheme from like it was a small town, like everybody in the town, like a lot of the, you know, elderly in the town and he was raising all this money. And next thing you know, you know, he had two sports cars, had a vacation home, uh, you know, but basically was just, you know, allegedly stealing the money. Uh, so it's definitely something that, you know, you just want to be careful, you know, uh, with who you invest with. And kind of segueing into number two, understanding, you know, the sponsor and their experience. I would say, you know, you've looked at their profile, you know who they are. That's like step one. It's kind of like evaluating a property, essentially. Mm -hmm. Like you do all the due mm -hmm. diligence, you, you know, mm -hmm. full title and everything. Mm -hmm. So the equivalent is knowing who you're dealing with, doing that like initial mm -hmm. background research on mm -hmm. who they are, how they present themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but then understanding, okay, what, what experience do they have in this specific mm -hmm. asset class? Not necessarily what experience do they have in real estate, but what experience do they have specific in notes or in multifamily or whatever that might be? Yeah. I like to, I use a different comparison. Okay. Is, you know, uh, you know, it's like if you're in a search for a nanny, you know, or some, some type of childcare. You know, basically it's you a want to do a background check on them. And then you also want to understand, you know, their experience, like you mentioned, uh, you know, with real estate, you know, I go back to childcare because of, you know, such a loving father I am, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so it's really, like you said, understanding your experience because some people may, you know, be very good at marketing and be able to really sell a product but they don't have, you know, the product is not fine to, you know, the product is their experience, which is extremely lacking. You know, I saw probably when I started my first fund several years, well, over four years ago now, there was another investor who did the same thing. He started a fund. He had never bought a note in his career. And he was starting a fund to buy notes. And I'm sitting there scratching my head, like, you know, he just spent probably $20,000 on documents to create all these documents to start a, a fund to raise money, but he's never actually bought a single note or spent his own money or his own blood, sweat, or tears into this business. To me, I, I'm of the op opinion that you definitely want to, you know, have somebody who's put their own money in the deal and or in the past. Um, but just really understands the business. And it's somebody who has the experience because you know, a lot of people, and we were talking about this earlier, Lauren, the last five years, like anybody could make money in real estate. You know, a lot of people were in the last five years, but now that we're starting to see the tides turn a little bit, you know, the Warren Buffett saying, I love is we're going to see, you know, who's been caught swimming naked. Cause once the tides roll back, you're going to see, you know, uh, you know, who got caught with their pants down essentially. And I haven't heard that one before. 
Oh yeah. Um, you know, so it's a, it's a 90 year old guy, so you can get away with saying stuff like that. Um, so I'm just repeating what he said, uh, disclaimer. but yeah, disclaimer, but I think it's important to understand, you know, their experience. And somebody mentioned to me, another example was like, you know, being on a flight, you want the, the pilot who's been through the storm. You don't want the guy on his first flight going through a bad storm. I was just going to use that analogy. I'm sorry. I stole your analogy. Driver's license. <laughs> like, do you want this kid who just got his driver's license driving you or so? Um, well, and on a fund, if it's a, you know, that if it's a large investment, it's not only someone who just got their license, but it's driving a Mack truck. Yeah. You know, because there's I, more I components say, to it. Yeah. And I think when it comes to like a fund, it also isn't just the sponsor. I think it's the team as well. Um, like who, what type of people do they employ? Like, you know, you can go to a company page and look at those people as well. Do your initial scan. Obviously the sponsor is the, you know, main person, but I always think it's important to see like what kind of team they've built as well. No, absolutely. Yeah. And when I refer to sponsor, I'm more referring to that team. You know, there's of course the, you know, typically the leadership of that sponsor and there's usually, you know, two or three people or one, two people at the top. And then of course they have a lot of people who assist with them who are just as important or more valuable because a lot of times they're the ones um, sometimes, you know, proverbial rolling up the sleeves and managing the assets. Yeah. And number three would be understanding their investment strategy. Yeah, this is, you know, and I'd say we're doing these in order. Um, you know, first two are critical. And then once you, they pass kind of, you know, the first and second gate, the third is, you know, what is their strategy, you know, and is it something you want to be a part of, you know, is it somebody who like for us, I I was just going to say, can you give me an example for our industry? Yeah. So for us in the, you know, mortgage note space, you know, our primary goal is to try and keep people in their properties and disclaimer, it doesn't happen all the time, unfortunately, but that is our primary goal. I know other investors who will buy distressed debt solely to foreclose on that asset. They have, you know, it's either that person repays the entire loan or they foreclose. Um, So it's important to understand that as well, because, you know, I think, especially in today's world, 30 years ago, uh, I think, you know, corporate America shifted a lot to, you know, a lot of ESG, um, you know, what does ESG stand for, for people? Um, I forget the E, but I think it's social good or you, so yeah, <laughs> it's a, basically making sure a, again, companies are still based on bottom dollar, bottom line, but it, there's a, Go ahead. It's environmental, social, and governance. So so I I think a lot of people think of the SG as social good, but yeah. Yeah. So really ours is the S in regards to the social side of things of, again, trying to keep people in their homes, avoid the blight, avoid additional crime for people breaking into those houses, using a drug house. Uh, A lot of things can happen in in that case. Um, So, you know, we want to look into that. The other thing um, to understand about their strategy is the fund and the fee structure. You know, how are their fees aligned and is it aligned with, you know, the right goals and mindset? Uh, And what I mean by that is, again, is it fee heavy for like acquisitions? So are they just going to sit there and try and acquire lots of assets and turn around and sell them real quick? Uh, because they're trying to profit from themselves versus potentially like in a note space, again, trying to work and help others. Um, Is the fee structure, you know, a preferred return is the investors get paid first. Uh, If there's all these management fees, if there's 10% of management fees that the fund is collecting up front, are you really getting paid first? You know, is there structure where, okay, there's the expenses and then the preferred returns, or is it loaded with fees because, I come from the general contracting background and trust me, you know, you have fees and then there's other things that might not be fees um, that still get counted towards fees and they make sure they get their profit all up front. Yeah. I, I think of this as asking like all the, what if questions I would Mm -hmm. say like of the five kind of different strategies you would employ. 
I think this section or this strategy, number three, understanding their investment strategy is where I hear a lot of investors or would imagine a lot of investors would ask the, what if, what if this happens? What if this happens? You know, mm-hmm. the worst case I think is kind of them understanding like the risks behind your strategy as well is, or the risks that they're willing to take behind your strategy. Mm-hmm. So not only can they get behind whatever strategy you have and do they have faith that you can execute that and that you have a good strategy in their mind, but also like, mm-hmm. does that sit well with their risk thresholds? We talk a lot about risk. So um, I think yeah. that's kind of where this falls. Well, also perfect example of that is, you know, again, we primarily invest in first position mortgage notes, but if we were a fund investing in underwater second position mortgage notes, meaning that the equity in the property is, you know, less than the, the note, whereas if they file bankruptcy or had the force to sell the house, you're going to get no money from that and could get completely wiped out. You know, that's some of the questions people should ask is what happens if, again, a lot of, the, like you said, the what ifs, that's a great yeah. example I didn't think of um, that's really involved because you want to know what the risks are because, of course, up front, everyone's going to, you know, tell you all the rosy things, but, you know, have they outlined all the risks for you? Yeah. Do they have an offering circular posted on their offering page um, <laughs> that lays them all out? No. Um, so I think this next one is kind of something I can s- speak to is understanding their reporting process. So something that I noticed, you know, immediately was that there's really not a lot of transparency and accessibility for investors in seeing, okay, like, how are things going, you know, and it's all over. There's no, like, there's no set standard in the real estate kind of investment world as to like how often people should be reporting to you, what they're reporting, how they're reporting. Mm -hmm. If you can log into a portal and see what distributions you're getting. So I think something that's really important is to figure out what's important to you as far as how much you want to be able to access and see. And then what does that sponsor provide? Do they provide a monthly email? Is it a newsletter? Is it, you know, do they record a video? Do they do a live video where you can ask questions? So that's like one aspect of it. But then I also think there's the on their own transparency where and reporting where do they have some sort of place where investors can go and log in and see, okay, this is how these are my contributions to the fund. These are my dividends or these are my distributions that I've received. This is when I should have received them just to see that, you know, again, everything's very, the financials are very transparent from their end. Yeah. I beat the drum on this or, you know, pound the table, whatever analogy you want to use on this in regards to the financial reporting. I think I'd like to think I've done a very good job over the years of being very transparent and open with the investors that I've worked with in the past and keep keeping them abreast of the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, with every deal. And, you know, my career started with my own money. Then I started doing JV deals and then kind of, you know, rolled up into the funds. And even at the JV deal level, I would every month send a financial statement out to that investor of all the information on the fund. And they're like, wow, this is awesome. You're the only person that does this. And I'm like, how do you know how well the deal is going if you don't see any financials? Like, well, I just like talk to them and stuff. I'm like, yeah, but that's talk. Like, you know, I can tell you like, oh yeah, I'm, you know, if you know a friend or your spouse is like, oh yeah, we're doing okay with the bank account. It's like, well, what does that mean? Like, can I see like how much money we have in our bank account? Um, you know, it's basically the same thing. And as you grow and do funds, you know, it's that financial reporting that is very important to know the health of that business or health of that entity uh are they making money uh you know how much are they making um are they investing all of the money that's very important in a fund to make sure that they're getting all that money out the door and that's the one this is kind of the the simplest way to tell if somebody's the real deal or not if you just ask them hey send me a sample of a financial report you've sent another investor if they can't quickly just grab something and, you know, screenshot and black out like the names and all the information on it and send it to you. Uh, That should be a a very big red flag. Yeah. So I think it's that, but also then having that other aspect of it from like an investor relations side, since that's what I do of giving them a place to go to look at stuff at their own pace at their own time. So like, say you email Mm -hmm. that out, send it out also Mm -hmm. housing it somewhere where they can log in whenever they want to access it. 
Mm -hmm. I feel it's something that to me is so like common sense, Mm -hmm. but isn't something I see very often in this world. Um, And if I was in like, if I was new to investing in real estate, I would be like, okay, so where do I go to see my information, you know, get my tax documents, you know, make sure that it's going to the right bank account, all of that stuff. Um, I think it's super important. And I look at it because my wife's in finance and, you know, she's the one who runs most of the finances of our family. And if I go, went and invested, you know, 25,000 in something, you know, I, I, then this is kind of how I run my business and she comes to me. Okay, great. You know, it's 25 grand. What'd you invest in? Let me see it. Let me log in. Let me do this. You know, because of course, you know, wife always wants to, you know, just double check, um, you know, make sure, you know, certain things, but, and that's the philosophy. It's like that I I think of, because I'm like, okay, if it was me, I'd want to be able to go see like what's going on and just, I mean, I still have comfort. I don't need to watch it every day, but once in a while, I just check in like, Hey, how's it going? Or, you know, yeah. a place that I can go on my own just to look and say, yeah. Oh yeah, there it is. Or like, you know, if I need a print report for, uh, for example, say I'm refinancing a house and I, you know, they're like, Oh, what do you have for investments? Oh, well, I can't go pull that report or I'm chasing somebody down for it. Well, yeah, I gave them money, but I can't kind of show you, I gave them money. I, you know, it's kind of, you know, if you sit back and think about it, you want to kind of scratch your head and like, what you just told me doesn't make sense. Yeah. And leading us into our last point would be number five, referrals. Okay. So <laughs> I think, you know, referrals are super important, but everyone's going to have people that they're going to send that are like, you know, everyone has their shining stars that investors that will, you know, they'll be able to send you. I think it's more knowing like what you're hoping to learn if you're asking for a referral. So if you're asking for a referral, have specific questions ready to ask that referral Mm -hmm. rather, or be able to tell the person like, Hey, I'm looking for a referral who's worked with you. Let's take it outside the note space on a, you know, flip in this area, or I'm looking for someone who invests, you know, a referral who has invested in one of your funds or done a JV deal with you. Those are very different experiences. Um, same person, but they might have different questions. So I'd say from the investor perspective and from someone who, you know, gets asked for referrals all the time, my question is always, okay, great. Like, so I can provide you with the best referral. What are you hoping to learn? You know, know what you're hoping to get from the referral other than just a like, yeah, like sponsors. Great. They're awesome. I get my money because typically that's when I most, that's most people, what their answer is going to be. So make sure you know exactly what you're looking for when you're wanting to speak with a referral so that you can get connected with the best mm-hmm. referral for you. So, so as a sponsor, think of it as going on a job interview and you're the employer and the sponsor is the empl- somebody trying to get a job. Do you think they're good? So the, take the documents of PPM, private placement memorandum, offering circular, like here's what we're offering. A resume. You, you know, they're going to hand you this beautiful document that is pristine and makes them look like they're the greatest thing since sliced bread. So they're going to give you that, which, you know, who's ever kind of handed a crappy resume to somebody? You're not going to put like, oh, here's what I suck at on my resume. Hands okay. resumes anymore. Okay. <laughs> then it's like, okay, great. This inter- yeah. This interview went great. Give me three referrals. Of course, you're going to give you three of your drinking buddies who you work with for 20 years who are going to say the greatest things about you anyways. So, you know, referrals, you know, it's good and bad um, because like you mentioned, A, you want to get honest, but you also want to try and get some. So you almost want to do some sourcing on your own. But the biggest key I'll also take away from re- references or referrals is, you know, if you hear somebody say, oh yeah, he's a good guy. Well, what do you mean by that? Did you actually give him money? And I see a lot in real estate space. A lot of people refer people to other people. And I'll be like, well, did you use them? Did you give them money? Well, yes. no, but this person did. Then you go to that person. Well, did you do that? No, but this person heard, told me. Then you look at it, it's like 15 people down. You actually never found anybody that actually worked with the person, but the guy's got 500 YouTube videos about you know how awesome he is. So somebody watched a video and said, oh, this guy sounds pretty good. He gave me some good content. And then that's kind of how it spun out yeah so it's and again it kind of comes back to like what are you hoping to get from the referral is it a character is it like a character referral you know Mm -hmm. you could that's 
several different people. It doesn't even have to be an investor. Or is it someone who's invested with them? Is it someone who's worked with or for them? I, I think there's so many different ways. So I just say, knowing, ask for referrals if you want a referral, but also know exactly what you're hoping to get from that referral and what questions you have for them so that whoever's providing the referral, whether it's a sponsor or someone on their team can provide you with the best, like the best person to fit, fill your answers, answer your yeah. question. Absolutely. So what are your final thoughts on all this? My final thoughts would be to just like anything, do your due diligence, know what you're willing to like, what you expect, what your expectations are. Mm -hmm. And I'd say those two things, do your due diligence and know what you're willing to accept. Like mm -hmm. as you're like, as someone you're giving your funds and investment to. Yeah, so I'm going to pull a little football analogy on, on, sure on right here. So, I mean, when you look at the sponsor or look at a deal, I think the sponsor is so critical. It's kind of like the quarterback in football is my analogy I'll use. And if you've got somebody like a Tom Brady, you know, been around for 25 years, you know, pretty much what you're going to get from him, you know, consistency, very good results. You know, if you go with somebody less experienced, they're going to have much better games and they're going to have much worse games. So you never know where on that roller coaster, if it's a newer um, sponsor, that, what you're going to get. Yeah. And that's something that each individual person, it's kind of like you get to choose. Do you want the consistency? Do you want that Tom Brady? Or do you want like to take that bigger risk. And that's like an individual decisions, but at least then if you do your due diligence, you talk to each person, you see their historical returns, you know where they're at, then you can make a better decision about that. You're not going into it blind thinking you're getting a Tom Brady and you're really getting a, I don't even know someone else. Okay. Can you name another quarterback in the league? Uh, who are you, Zach Wilson? Okay, there you go. Okay, yeah, you're like, who's Zach Sam Newton, Wilson? wasn't he something? <laughs> yeah, he's out of football now. <laughs> okay, like, yeah, no. Okay. Um, we'll just have to be clear of the sports analogies on my part. Um, so, Chris, any other final thoughts? Uh, I mean, just back to the beginning, like we said, take your time, do your due diligence, ask the questions, make sure you're comfortable with, you know, the sponsor's team and who you're talking with. And, you know, make sure you understand what it is you're investing in and what the terms of that investment are. So the more you, they can communicate and everybody understands the, uh, the deal itself and their experience and how they're going to manage it, the, the better off it will be. Yeah. And you pretty much kind of, I was just going to say something, but you pretty much already said it. So with that, I think we should do another episode on maybe questions to ask a sponsor. So, yeah, I think that we can wrap into, you know, we went through all these, you know, strategies. kind of five top strategies, but people are probably like, great. I understand these strategies, but how do I implement these strategies? And we've got a bunch of questions that we can provide and we can talk about that you, as you're going to interview a sponsor can kind of ask or get some basis to reformulate those questions to get the information that you'd be looking for to make a intelligent decision. Yeah. Anything else? I'm good. I'll let you take her home. Okay. Thank you guys so much for joining us today on this episode of the CWS podcast. If you enjoyed the show, share it with a friend, subscribe, or leave us a review. Until next time. Thank you. Thank you for joining Lauren and I on this episode of the Creating Wealth Simplified podcast. Each week, we bring you expert education, experience, and information in a digestible format to help you identify investment opportunities so you can build wealth through real estate and take action toward your financial goals. Enjoy the show, share with a friend or subscribe to the show, and leave us a review. 